Dragons are certainly a thing in D&D. They are actually one of the Ds of D&D, the second one. Dragons get a whole creature type to themselves in the game. Four different stages depending on whether they are old enough to drive or vote. Entire books devoted to them, like a hundred different weird cousins to beef up that monster type that don't get invited to the Dragon Christmas office party. And... I don't love them. And I'm gonna tell you why. I'm Pointy Hat, this is D&D with a twist, and we're finally talking about the dragons of Dungeons and Dragons. So when I think of dragons, I think of... In this D&D with a Twist dog and pony show series, I talk about a D&D thing, tell you a bit about how it goes, I poke it with a stick a little to see what it does for the game, and then I give you a whole free thing at the end of the video to use in your D&D games. And I may have, you know, mentioned once or twice in other videos that... Uh, I'm I'm not the, the biggest dragon fan around. I don't want to hear more crying about how I hate dragons. You have impossibly cool treasure planet ships and you give these guys dragons? Whatever, I hate dragon. Dragon free channel, I'm not talking about them. I refuse to talk about dragons, you can't make me. I hate dragons! But, but wait, 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 wait. I have my reasons. So before you dragon fans come pitchforks in hand into my house where I live and do my dark biddings on the internet in, allow me to plead my case. And in order to do that, let's see what these big lizards actually are in D&D, and in general. So in order to talk dragons in D&D, we gotta talk dragons in general. Just general dragon lore. General dragon lore is kind of like an understatement, as nearly every culture in the globe has something that could be called a dragon if you really, really, really want to prove a point. From the fire-breathing evil European lizards, to the water-type snake Pokemon of Eastern Asia, to, I don't know, Quetzalcoatl in Mesoamerica, if you want to push for what is allowed on the dragon wiki page. Dragon-like creatures are everywhere and they are all very different. Some are evil, some are good, some are basically animals and others are impossibly wise, some inhabit the realms of 90s children cartoons, and some are relegated to outdated gamer memes. The world of dragons is vast and far too boring to get into this video. What you need to know is that D&D kind of maps their dragons exclusively to what is commonly referred to as Western dragons, as opposed to Eastern dragons of places like China, Korea, or Japan. Dragons in D&D are impossibly powerful things? Monsters? Race? I'm, I'm going with race. I'm, I'm gonna go with race. They are these incredibly old race of lizards that basically precede everything, including elves, and elves are often assumed to be the oldest ones, so guess they are taking an L there. That also means that D&D dragons subscribe to the big lizard school of thought. Dragons are mostly quadruped lizards with long necks, big wings, and a bigger ego. Because of being in the literal title of the game and sort of the poster child of the game, D&D dragons have had like 77 moments in the spotlight throughout the editions of the game. To the point where very fun people on Twitter call D&D the dragon game, and one of these dragons is currently renting the ampersand in the middle of the Ds. Cool logo though. Anyway, this means we get like a thousand dragon families, so let's take a look at some of them. But before we do that, we need to find said dragons, and that's no easy task. If you're doing dragon studies, you will be expected to not just jump to wildly different biomes, but different planes of existence. So you better have access to a lot of teleportation spell scrolls. Or you could try a different way. Did you know there's a tavern out there that can help with this? People don't go there for ale or wine, but for teas and coffees. And more importantly, portals. By simply drinking their magically infused brews, you could be transported to wildly different places and even different planes, as if your mug was an extra plane or portal. The name of this establishment? The Many Worlds Tavern. And guess what? They've sent me their magical brews! I don't have a mouth to drink them with. Familiar? I'll go get the box. Yes, as you can see, I have acquired these powerful magical concoctions for myself, and you can too! Many Worlds Tavern is an online coffee and tea company that sells coffee for game nights and tea for tabletop. Imagine opening a box of tea based on magical places you could visit in your D&D campaign and finding dice inside, and other things! That's part of their fabled foliage, loose leaf tea and herbal series they recently rolled out, with only 1k bags available each first of the month. And each bag contains stickers, cards, and actual magic spells cards and a full set of dice. Imagine what an incredible Christmas gift this would make for any coffee or tea lovers in your life, including you! 
I bought Sage's Gate for myself with my own Earthling money at PAX Unplugged, and I absolutely love it. And I'm not much of a tea drinker myself, so that says something. So if all of this sounds good, the first 100 people to use my code, POINTY10, will get 10% off of their orders at checkout. That's right, this one is limited, so think fast. The link to Many Worlds Tavern is the first link in the description. The discount code is POINTY10 once again. And thank you Many Worlds Tavern for your sponsorship. And now that we know how to get to these dragons, let's find out which different types of dragons are out there. First, we're gonna talk about the two biggest and most well-known ones, Chromatic and Metallic Dragons. Chromatica Dragons are based on the colors of the rainbow, and they are evil. Yep, I, I was also surprised when I first started playing this game and I found out that the technicolor ones were the mean ones. Chromatic Dragons are said to be greedy, egotistical, aggressive, dumb, silly, goofy, lazy, total uggos, super fake... W wait, no. Sorry, I, I mixed up my notes with the diary of a metallic dragon. C cut, cut. Their scales are, you guessed it, one specific color, and each color is tied to a specific breath. Red being associated with fire, black being acid, blue being lightning, green being poison, and white being Christmas. Those are the main ones, but someone must have shown the guys at Watsi a coloring book or something because we got a bunch of extra colors in older editions. With brown dragons that breathe acid, again, purple dragons that breathe psychic? energy and pink dragons that breathe bubbles let's not dwell deeper into that let's move on and like a bunch more but the more important ones are the big five red black blue green and white and i'm not the one saying that the chromatic dragon's literal queen tiamat agrees since she has five heads and i don't see any of them being purple or brown or pink the fact that tiamat is the god of chromatic dragons and also a literal arch devil from hell kind of clues you in that these guys might not be all that nice? That's right, chromatic dragons are yet another victim of my dreaded nemesis alignment rules. But for each bad dragon... No, 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 stop. Do not Google that. There must be good dragons. And that's where metallic dragons come into the mix. Metallica dragons, as opposed to chromatica dragons, are the good ones. Technically. I mean, they tell us they are, and it says so on the stat block, so I guess. They are said to be altruistic, righteous, brave, kind, valiant, beautiful, super loyal, the best BFF you could ever have, not fake like Kelly or Jen from Biology. Oh. Oh god, this is the Metallic Dragon Journal again. Cut, cut. She's super thick, she's super pretty. Metallic Dragons, you guessed it, have metallic scales. Good job. These kind of track one-to-one -one with Chromatic Dragons, except that Metallic Dragons get two breath weapons. Gee, Metallic Dragons, why does Bahamut let you have two breaths? Anyway. Gold Dragons have both a fire breath and a weakening breath that gives you disadvantage on strength saves. Copper Dragons have acid and slowing breath. Bronze Dragons have electrical malfunction breath and a repulsion breath, also known as garlic breath. Silver Dragons have a cold breath and a paralyzing breath, which sounds like the same one. I think this one here might be cheating. It doesn't count as a second breath if you're just freezing them still like frozen. And finally, Brass Dragons get a Sleep Breath and a Fire Breath. I guess Poison was too evil for the Goody Two Shoes Dragons. Anyway, these guys also come with weird cousins that they don't want to invite to Thanksgiving dinner. Iron Dragons are part of a sub-sub-category of Metallic Dragons called Ferris Dragons. Jesus, there's just so many of these lizards, my god. And they're said to be mean and sometimes evil, so who knows why Metallic Dragons are said to be always good? Guess they weren't. Or yes, I don't know, these guys are not in 5e, who cares? Mercury dragons breathe poisonous light? Okay. And are also said to be insane. Great, okay, moving on. Just like chromatic dragons have the Dombi Mommy Tiamat, metallic dragons have their own daddy Dom, Bahamut. The things I get up and say on the internet where people can hear me, my god. Bahamut is the king of metallic dragons and their patron deity. He doesn't get five heads to do comedy bits with, but rather platinum scales that are super, super powerful and indestructible and impossible to break, and no spells can go through them or, or like around them, and also no swords or nothing. Oh, sorry. This time it isn't a metallic dragon journal, but just a drawing by a six-year-old with notes around it? Fascinating. Bahamut's eyes are inflicted with Mary Sue fanfic disease, said to change color with his mood and be impossible to describe. With the horny detail, go off. And he's also just said to be a very chill guy that doesn't believe in retributive justice and champions forgiveness after due punishment, right down to being an actual deity of justice. Cool. So that's the two main types of dragons, and somehow, believe it or not, I told you there were too many of these, we're not even halfway done with these. My god. Okay, let's speed this up, we can always do a full video on any of these, there's just way too many, I'm pulling out the lightning rod. Planar dragons, dragons associated with the planes of existence, as if they weren't complicated enough. Although these are actually really cool and less Pokemon-y than metallics and chromatics. You have fairy dragons for the Feywild, shadow dragons for... guess. 
then the upper planes get stuff like Radiant Dragons, who are basically Angel Dragons, or Battle Dragons, who are like Viking Dragons that love a fair fight. While the evil lower planes have stuff like Howling Dragons, <laughs> who are characterized by being bad crazy, but also geniuses. Styx dragons that literally live in the river Styx, you know, in hell. And Tartarian dragons named after Tartarus, who are literal prison wardens of the prison plane of Carceri. Man, these are like seven times more interesting than the technical dragon or the variegated copper dragon. More of these, please. Gem dragons. If we had good dragons and bad dragons, stop it. Stop it with a joke. We of course needed neutral dragons. These guys have, how did you guess, gemstone scales. And they generally keep through themselves and don't meddle with anything ever and were generally created so that DMs can give you someone to beg at for help for like an hour before they decide to actually help you. They are also all psychic themed because of their dad, not Bahamut, but Sardior, the first gem dragon and the product of Bahamut and Tiamat's pre-divorce union. Sardior has since exploded and we don't have time to get into it. Moving on. Standouts among gem dragons are amethyst dragons who are the most powerful of the the gem lizards, purple enjoyers rejoice, and topaz dragons who are just my favorite because they are said to have like no social graces and just be generally a pain to talk to, but also really love beaches and explicitly the feeling of the salty breeze on their skin. Copacabana dragon is the best dragon. Long dragons, romanized long with a U for no good reason and literally meaning dragon dragon in Chinese, joining the Chai Ti and Ahituna Hall of Fame of bad names, are the resident Eastern dragon representation in D&D. They were introduced with Karator, the D&D setting of discourse. Long dragons are more celestial than dragon as they are part of the celestial bureaucracy in the setting they come from. This is kind of accurate. Some dragons did serve a divine role in Chinese mythology, but many also absolutely didn't. So I guess the bureaucracy part is accurate though. They are tasked with specific things, like defending specific places like rivers, or tasked with making sure that things like, I don't know, rain happen. What time is it? Oh god, I'm so bad at this lightning round thing. Okay, engaging extra, extra lightning round for the really weird cousins. Brain Stealer Dragon, Mind Flayer Dragon. They happen when a Mind Flayer tadpole infects a dragon, and they are surely not a good idea for Mind Flayers to make, since they are known to turn on them. They have a Mind Flayer tadpole breath code. Gross! I wish we had seen these in Baldur's Gate 3. Anyway, Dragon Turtles, exactly what it sounds like. Big Turtle Dragon. These are very much a thing in many Asian and Pacific Island mythologies, and they are generally benevolent, or at least capable of help, and particularly known for their wisdom. But in D&D, they're just a big turtle that loves hoarding and gold, and kills people, and wants people out of their swamp. I mean, ocean. We could have had Avatar, but we got this. Great. Song dragons. Were dragons. Kinda. Not really. These ones like to live among people and for some reason only disguise themselves as women. Even male song dragons. I wonder why. These bard bait dragons prefer to be in their person form rather than their lizard form, which is not the case for dragons that can change appearance. And the woman they turn into is like explicitly said to be young and very beautiful. Interesting. This is plainly horny monster design. I tried my very best to find something else, but I truly think they're called song dragons because they just like music. That's, that's it. And finally, I know there are like 34 more, but we have to move on. There's too many of these. Draco Liches. Did you think I wouldn't talk about these ones? It's what you think it is, undead dragons with their soul tied to a phylactery. Why would a dragon do this if dragons are basically immortal? Well, most of them don't. As in, they don't do this willingly. Draco liches are a weird lich in that most examples of them are of dragons that were inflicted with lichdom rather than having chosen it. And so they were forced to walk the path of the Digimon. There's not much to say about these guys, they're just dragon liches. You get it. Okay, so that's a massive primer on D&D dragons. We've talked chromatic, we've talked metallic, we've talked weird cousins, we've talked general lore, and I've promised you to finally talk about my beef with dragons and give you something for free in this video. So how about we give dragons and you twist? So you want to fight a dragon? Don't mess with me, buddy. <laughs> Dragons are the monsters for people that read too many fantasy books as kids and furries that insist you call them scalies. Dragons are extremely popular as like a fantasy concept. One could argue they are the most popular fantasy thing. I don't know. What can really compete with them? The, the vague concept of magic? Even heavy hitters like unicorns have nothing on the hegemony of dragons in popular culture. Throughout the globe, in general. These lizards are here to stay, especially in a game named after them. So why don't I like them that much? Here's the thing. In D&D, if you're not particularly enthused by the aesthetic of the dragon, if you don't think they look cool, which is where I'm at, dragons really don't offer you much of anything at all? Hear me out. I've called this the Godzilla problem. 
Dragons are cool to a lot of people, just visually. Big winged lizard, real smart, breathes fire, mostly, sometimes. And I understand that that visual is very appealing to many people, and very, very appealing to some of you. <clears throat> and I'm not here to kink shame. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But I'm here to say that if you're not in the camp of dragons look cool, if they don't look cool to you, dragons don't give you much to work with in D&D at all. Godzilla is an extremely powerful thing, creature monster, it rises from the depths to terrorize Japanese people and be an embodiment of their cultural anxiety towards nuclear war. Dragons are certainly very powerful monsters in D&D, they can accomplish the same thing Godzilla can, they can raise cities to the ground, they can certainly put your players through a tough time, but they are not much more than that. Just like Godzilla, they are powerful, but looking at their stat block, that is really, really where it ends with dragons. They are a threat, but I find they are not particularly evocative to base quests around. A dragon can very much destroy, but based on his stat block, it can do much more than that. Especially when like 70% of them prefer to stay in the middle of nowhere in whatever biome matches their Pokemon type. Yes, they are also smart, but so what? Plenty of monsters are also smart, this doesn't make dragons anything special. And nothing in their stat block really takes advantage of this, other than the fact that it's their spellcasting ability. But pointy, I hear you say, dragons can turn into people and can cast spells. Yes, they can. Let's talk about both of those. First, for the spells, most of these are combat spells, so it just goes further towards making them powerful in battle, which, as I discussed, is not the issue I'm here to talk about. They are powerful enough, that's not the problem. The rest of their non-combat spell really pales in comparison to any spellcasting monster, and also who is running D&D official dragons as spellcasters anyway? Nobody. You run them as big monster things, because their spells aren't that great, and because if you're running dragons in combat, you are running Magical Godzilla every time. Running a spellcasting dragon is just not a thing that people do. Generally, that'd be so crazy. Super crazy. Anyway, next. For the human thing, yeah, they can indeed turn into a person, at which point, does it even feel like a dragon anymore? If the quest you are gaining access to by putting a dragon in your game is because they are pretending to be a person, it's not that dragons as a monster are evoking adventure ideas, you're just using a person to make a quest around and then revealing that it was a dragon the whole time. And then you run a Godzilla fight. Again! A fight against a thing that hits hard and has a lot of hit points and that's it. Nothing intrinsic to the dragon has made that quest possible because they are a dragon, unless it's to give a reason as to why this random person is so powerful. In which case, yeah, we both agree that dragons are powerful. There's also something to be said about overuse. Mythology is an almost never-ending source of inspiration for monsters, adventures, and characters. And because it's so vast, it really, really gets old when we keep going back to one thing. Especially if you don't find that thing all that cool looking. Dragons have had their spot in the limelight a lot. They are bound to become samey and all hat after a while. Especially if all they show up to do is destroy whatever the heroes care about. Once again, Godzilla problem. They sure are flammable, but not much else. But I didn't come to this video to complain about dragons and leave it there. And I understand that there's plenty of people, believe me, I look at my comments, out there that absolutely love the concept of dragons and the look of them. So I want to do the impossible. I want to both appeal to dragon lovers and dragon haters. I want to make a dragon that dragon enjoyers can enjoy, but that makes it easy for you to base quests, adventures, entire campaigns around hell, even player characters if you want a dragon-heavy backstory. Isn't that what players that like dragons want to do? And why not try to make dragons feel distinct? Use some of the aspects of their mythology that are often ignored. So I think I have a solution. Hear me out, hordes. Dragons are known to hoard things, at least in Western cultures they are. That's like one of their defining traits, and it's barely explored in D&D. What if we took that and used it to make dragons that play massive roles in the worlds that they inhabit, instead of living in bumf nowhere swamp mountain volcano, or pretending to be a goblin to live in society where no one even knows they're a dragon? But how do we do that? Hear me out, time soon. People. We're gonna make dragons that hoard people. Let's go. Even among the widely different draconic families, there is bound to be those that break the mold, and Warden Dragons are exactly that. While most dragons hoard prized magical items, mountains of gold, or spoils from previous battles, Warden Dragons are defined by their hordes, because their hordes are people. This focus on amassing quantities of select mortals as part of their hordes makes Warden Dragons inherently social creatures. Whereas many dragons prefer the peace and quiet of the natural world, or the unending solitude of the ether surrounding the plains, warden dragons make their home and keep their hordes where people live. Because of their very nature, warden dragons, especially the most powerful ones, end up naturally playing key roles in the power structures of the societies they inhabit. 
But the differences between Warden Dragons and other members of the Draconic family don't end there, with another important difference being how Warden Dragons grow in power. The juvenile stage of any Warden Dragon starts by finding a specific mortal that matches the horde they want to build. That mortal is soon joined by a small group of other mortals, and as the horde grows in number, so does the power of the dragon. A Warden Dragon's power is not measured in years lived like it is for other dragons, but in how many mortals have joined its horde. The horde of a Warden Dragon is not only its most prized possession, but also the source of their power, and the only way that any Warden Dragon can ensure its continued existence. Warden Dragons do not lay eggs. Instead, they select one of the members of their horde, one that shows particular promise and aptitude, often referred to as a prince. Once the time is right, the dragon will perform a ritual with the prince with the goal of transferring their draconic essence into the prince. If successful, a new Warden Dragon will be born from the prince as they transform into said dragon, maintaining the essence of the original dragon within them. This way, Warden Dragons literally birth their successors from their hordes. So connected are these dragons to their hordes that the kind of people they take under their wings dictates the sort of Warden Dragon they are. There are many different types of Warden Dragons, and these are not defined by the color or material of their scales, but the company they keep. Magus Dragons hoard arcane practitioners, Elder Magus Dragons being known to form massive universities where arcane knowledge is exchanged and learned. Warrior Dragons make their hordes into armies with a strict hierarchy and military training, the members of the Dragon's army and horde sharing in exclusive fighting styles taught by the Dragon itself. Paragon Dragons, on the other hand, form orders of knights that all band under a common creed, a strong moral code dictated by the Dragon, but earnestly believed and followed by each member of the horde, as they are sent in oath-sworn missions to work towards whatever the oath that bands them together is striving to achieve. Some scholars believe that it's the proximity to mortals and their mortality that gives Warden Dragons their characteristic appearance. Instead of being defined by the color of their scales, Warden Dragons can be recognized not just by the horde, but the animal characteristics each of them take on while retaining the reptile-like appearance that all dragons share. Despite the massive differences between each type of Warden Dragon, they all share the commitment to growing their horde. Some hordes are made out of willing participants that join the ranks of like-minded individuals under the leadership of an impossibly powerful dragon to grow in power and in their area of expertise. But some others are forced into a life of servitude to the dragon, as the dragon's power grows with each unwilling addition to the horde, both the servant and the source of power to an unknowable being much more powerful than any lone member of the horde. Which method will a warden dragon choose to grow its horde? Only each individual warden dragon can say. How about that? D&D class dragons, wizard dragons, bar dragons, maybe mystic dragons. Who knows? I'm pretty proud of them. I think Warden Dragons address my problems with D&D dragons pretty thoroughly. They are still powerful, but they also give you massive amounts of potential quests to base around them that don't necessarily have to revolve around them being a big Godzilla monster that hits real hard and destroys a bunch of stuff. Exclusively, they are way more intrinsically connected with the part of the world in D&D that matters, the part where people and big players in stories live. They're not far off into some mountain doing nothing and waiting for people to show up to kill it. They are even basically set up to be big players in stories, since they are the heads of massive organizations because of how their hordes work. If you think about it, something as powerful as a dragon would be a massive player in any world they inhabit because of their power. And Warden Dragons exemplify this beautifully, I think. And the focus on the Horde thing makes them feel more specifically dragons with a clear reference to the mythology that is rarely the focus of dragons in D&D. But they are not just a DM tool. You can very clearly make a ton of player characters that use Warden Dragons if you like them. I often say that a monster is not all that useful or cool if you can't find ways to put them in your game as a player or as a DM. So how about we do just that? Let's take one class, one of the random examples we gave in that little lore drop, and flesh it out. How about... Let's make one we haven't done yet on the channel and y'all scream at me in the comments for. Let's make a wizard dragon. Magus dragons, like all warden dragons, hoard people. And the people that make up a Magus horde are exclusively arcane practitioners. Wizards are most populous in a Magus dragon's horde. But it's not rare to see lore bards among their ranks and even a rare city druid. You will, however, never find warlocks, sorcerers, or clerics among their ranks. Magus dragons are powerful spellcasters, but their magic is not innate. They studied it, and as a result, they feel a deep, seething hatred towards any magic they feel hasn't been acquired through careful and long study. 
Sorcerers and warlocks are most often the subjects of their scorn, as magus dragons see them as cheaters, taking shortcuts or being unfairly advantaged by their lineage as the only reasons why they are able to wield the weave of magic at all. This outlook on magic as something to be rigorously studied and mastered leads Magus Dragons to form hordes, not of any arcane practitioners, but only of those that are willing and motivated by the prospect of countless hours of study. This might seem like a fate worse than death to some, but to others, those that would benefit and thrive in the horde of a Magus, they see this as an incredible opportunity. A Magus Dragon has been amassing knowledge for all of its life. Some of its arcane secrets passed down to it by its predecessor in the ritual to pass along its draconic essence. The secrets that Magus Dragons can teach their horde are innumerable and often reason enough to join said horde as a wizard. Magus Dragons follow Warden Dragons in their animalesque appearance, taking on more avian traits that make them resemble owls, but replacing the white down of the owl by the Magus' Dragon trademark massive beards, which all Magus Dragons sport regardless of sex. It is said that the traditional idea of a wizard having a long white beard comes from the first wizards imitating their draconic leaders. When a Magus Dragon has accrued enough members, its horde is called a circle, and particularly big circles find themselves becoming veritable universities. Some of the oldest and most renowned institutions of arcane learning are the circles of a Magus Dragon, centuries old in their study of the arcane. This academic approach to horde making has some interesting results. First, it's very, very common for circles to develop intense and fierce rivalries towards one another. Universities led by elder Magus Dragons end up as bitter rivals, keeping their best kept secrets from one another, all while sending members of their hordes into rival universities to unearth those well kept secrets. Many a wizard tavern brawl has started with a conversation over which Magus Dragon is most knowledgeable. The process of prince selection for a Magus Dragon is also a product of this insistence on academia. A Magus Dragon generally never goes off of instinct when making any decision, much less the decision that will dictate which body its draconic essence will embody next. Members of a Magus Dragon circle are constantly being graded, and their grades are shared publicly amongst all members of the circle. Their arcane discoveries, their research papers, and their exam results are constantly broadcast to the Horde and whoever is most academically gifted is who will one day be chosen as the prince to transform into a Magus Dragon. Faced with this relentless competition, many students throw themselves into their studies, and once they have exhausted everything their circle could offer them, they move their coveting eyes outwards. It's not uncommon for wizards who wish to rise in their circle to go on adventures, seeking knowledge that not even their dragon knows, in an effort to rise above the other pupils and be chosen as the next prince. This, of course, doesn't go without rivalries, and it's regrettably not uncommon for the most bitter of rivalries to end in sudden and inexplicable deaths of fellow academics, as the most brilliant minds of a circle fight in a constant battle of wits and magic to prove themselves superior to the rest, all the while enriching the dragon they have sworn fealty to and deepening the dragon's pool of knowledge. The most evil of the Magus Dragons will do this on purpose, using spite and jealousy as a way to motivate their horde into growing the dragon's knowledge for itself, caring little about the mental strain that this constant competition causes amongst horde mates. That's a pretty sick dragon concept that you can base a PC or a full adventure around, I think. Think about it, you could play the smartest student of a Magus Dragon circle as they leave on their quest to secure their position as the prince by learning even more things from the outside world, all while dodging the attacks of jealous students. Good thing you can always rely on your good friend, best friend from backstory. Oh, what's that? Best friend from backstory is also trying to kill you? Oh, the drama, the humanity. Or how about a particularly incompetent wizard that is trying their hardest to be chosen as a prince? They might not be the best at studying, so they put all their eggs in one basket, discovering the magical secrets of the rival circle to impress their dragon. I can think of so many characters, and hopefully you can too. Well, hopefully not, because Magus dragons don't exist. Warden dragons as a concept don't exist. I mean, N not in the way that D&D things don't exist because they are fantasy and make-believe, but, but, but in the way that I just made them up for, for this video. You know, for, for fun. I mean, I guess you could make them yourself. Have fun doing that, I guess. It's always tough to make dragons, I find. Especially a spellcasting one, because a wizard dragon has to feel like a spellcasting one, right? Oh, that's a weird monster to make for sure. Good luck. Oh, what's that? You want me to make the stab lock? Despite you knowing full well I am a certified dragon hater. How? Dare you? Okay, 
That's right, the Magus Dragon stat block is in the description of this very video for 100% certified pointy hat free for you to use in your own games for also 100% certified free. But wait, what if you're still not into dragons, but you're looking for another cool monster to base your campaign around? Well, here are two full videos about liches in which I make some funky class based liches that are in wizards, a barbarian and a ranger. Look at that. As a matter of fact, let me drop a full lich playlist for you to do. Yes, I am covering all classes. Will I do a series on dragons too? It honestly fully depends on how this video does. So if y'all like this, share, comment, like, subscribe. I'm being 100% for real. If the video doesn't do well, I'm not making it. So make YouTube see this. Bother your mom. Okay, let's see how it goes. Bye-bye now. Bye. Mwah.